Mystical Light Beings and welcome to Lena Mystic where we embrace our spiritual awakenings by identifying our personal power and authentic selves. I'm here to help you to decode spiritual signs and synchronicities so that you can get on your authentic path to purpose. Today's video is about the lovely dear spirit animal, what it means for you, why it's showing up, why it's so consistent in your life, and what that poetic meaning is behind seeing it. Those of you who are new, I love to spiritually decode for people. So I often have blogs on my website where you may be able to find spirit animal meanings, angel number meanings, and they're even on here as well. I also do tarot readings, so if you wanted to book me for that, you can go ahead and do that at lenamysticoracle.com. I also have social media where I post almost every day different spirit guide messages, so you can follow me at Lena Mystic Oracle. So first, I like to talk about the curious facts. So there are 43 different species of deer so far that we have found as a civilization. <laughs> and some of these are elk, moose, reindeer, etc. These 43 species can be found pretty much everywhere except Antarctica as far as studies have shown, which is very odd for me that when I uh, did my research, I didn't see that there were reindeer in Antarctica, but I totally believe that there are definitely deer and Antarctica, it's just maybe we don't see them because we're not really in Antarctica, you know what I mean? Now some of you may have noticed that I said that moose go under the category of cervidae or deer. Moose are actually the largest members of the deer family. The most common ones that we see in North America are the white-tailed deer, black-tailed deer, and the mule deer. The white-tailed deer can be found in every state in the US except Alaska. It's the deer that we're pretty much most familiar with. The characteristics of the white-tailed deer is literally it having a white tail. And oftentimes you may notice that their throat or around their eyes are white as well, and even their stomach. The mule deer has really large ears and can be found throughout Western North America or the borders of the Pacific Ocean. They have a distinct characteristic where they will have kind of like a mask right here. Uh, where their eyes are and their head is and it'll be darker tint than the rest of their body They also often have black on their tail. Their tails are even smaller than the white-tailed deer as well The black-tailed deer very similar to the white-tailed deer no. is named pretty much based off of its characteristics So the black-tailed deer will have a black tail Underneath its tail, on its tail, it's mostly a black tail, if not all black. They also have dark antlers. Uh, the males will have dark antlers. And they kind of change depending on the cooler or the warmer months. While it's colder outside, they're going to have like a brownish grayish tint. And while it's warmer outside, they're going to have a reddish brown tint. And that's probably to help them with their camouflage so that they are not, they can kind of blend in from their predators. Now a lot of us are familiar that the baby deer is called a fawn and these fawns have little white spots all over their body which helps them with camouflage believe it or not. They also are born scentless which was so weird for me to find out because I'm like how are you born scentless? <laughs> like even when we smell babies they have that baby scent but fawns are born scentless and this helps them to camouflage as well and keep predators away and not be able to smell them. Now, when I did a little bit more research and I didn't put this in the article, I found that the way to keep them scentless is for the mother deer to consume their urine and their feces. I didn't wanna put that in the article because I don't feel like anybody wants to read that. And I don't even know why I told you guys that, but yeah, the mother will consume their feces and their urine to make sure that the predators do not find them. On average, fawns can stand about 10 minutes on their own after being born. And they can walk just about seven hours after being born, within that seven hour period. The mother deer will often leave her fawns so that she can go forage for food and whatever she needs to do. She does this because she does not want to attract predators to her little babies. Those of you who don't know, female deer are called doe and male deer are called bucks. You can often tell the difference by the presence of antlers. Now, female caribou are pretty much the only ones found to have antlers that are, you know, that are female, of course. I'm not sure that's completely true because I feel like there's always going to be the unique individual that has antlers, a unique female that has antlers that may not be a female caribou. 
each year deer will lose their antlers and they will grow back and they're very similar to how they were before except they may be bigger or stronger. Bucks will actually commonly spar one another and they initiate the sparring by bowing their heads and showing their antlers and the other buck can respond and say yes or no basically by bowing as well. This is around rutting season which is end of September to December. Sparring actually allows the bucks to either command dominance or to claim a doe or to even just test their strength. Something I found quite amazing and just strange is that the doe's pregnancy will actually depend on how big or small she is. So if the species is a smaller type of deer, her pregnancy will probably be shorter. And if she's a bigger deer, then her pregnancy will be longer. They normally on average give birth to one to three deer, but the most common is two deer at a time. Now that we've talked about the pretty cool facts and the curious facts of the deer, we're gonna go ahead and get into the spiritual meaning, which is why you probably came here. I wanted to share that personally, I have seen deer a lot in my life. They've shown up since I was a little girl. They've always Always just kind of been around and lately I feel like they've been trying to give a message so I wanted to dive deep into their characteristics their lifestyle their life cycle and all of that stuff just so that I can understand what message the deer gives us when they arrive the first one that I noticed is that the deer is telling us to be gentle with our spirit it shows up at a time where you've probably proclaimed your strength and your tough skin day after day night after night and as a person that you are you've been through many many challenges and had to jump over many many hurdles and the deer is saying don't allow yourself to become numb because we need that emotion we need that passion in your life so don't let yourself become numb don't numb your deepest and truest emotions because that is what helps us get through those tough times allow yourself to become more vulnerable allow yourself to become compassionate and even understanding towards your spirit we often lose ourselves in life becoming numb to things and that actually leads us to depression so the deer asks you to face all that you are so that you can you know heal the parts of you that feel unheard unappreciated and just unloved Every single experience, every part of you plays this significant role in your life. To unclear the tears you hold back and the deep breaths you forget to take, all of that is very important. So give yourself time, give yourself care, give yourself gentleness because you deserve it. Let your spirit reveal to you what needs to be heard, what needs to be given love to so that you can give your spirit all that it desires. Hi, honey. <laughs> and remember that your spirit deserves love, compassion, and understanding. You are worthy of those things. The second one that I found is grace and strength. You have this ability just to showcase your elegance while going through these difficult times, these hardships. And the deer tells you that this is a wonder, wonderful, wonderful gift to have. So never let anyone take you out of your higher vibrational self. Never feel like you have to stoop down to anyone's level just to match their energy, to show them how they're treating you, because that is not who you are. Remain at your frequency and continue to rise because grace definitely is strength and you want to remember that. So all you have to do is just remove yourself from the negative energies of other people. Take a break from toxic people. Take a break from toxic environments. Actually, stop going to toxic environments. <laughs> you know, but some, some people we love, but they can be toxic or they can be saying things that are taking us out of our vibration. And you want to remove yourself from those circumstances. Your job is just to radiate at your highest form of frequency so that you can spread that frequency and so that it can be contagious. So continue to walk around in your high frequency because everyone deserves to be able to do that. If you feel that someone is taking you out of who you are, remove yourself from that environment. Remove yourself from that person. The third thing that I found is release the old to bring in the new. And this has been the big energy, I want to say, of the last couple of years, especially with COVID happening. It's just been a little crazy. And I feel like it's saying release the old ways and 
start embracing the new things that are being welcomed to your life the new blessings and sometimes this means getting rid of some stuff at your home that just doesn't vibrate at the same frequency that you're at so that the prayers that you've asked for can actually be welcomed into your life imagine yourself praying for something over and over again but you already have something that takes the place of that you have to get rid of that thing to welcome in the new thing that you've been asking for or else there is no space for that thing this includes the people you're around the relationships that you're in just make sure you can remove some of these things or take a break from some of these things and then try to analyze whether it is at your frequency or if it's too low or if it's weighing you down or picking you up what is it doing for you analyze the different environments in your life and see if it's fueling you or breaking you remember that the things that you prayed for consist of change and will require you to get rid of the things that no longer match your energy and the energy or vibrations of your desires in your prayers when you realize that something is weighing you down more than lifting you up you definitely need to take a break and analyze the pros and the cons of keeping it around to me i feel like if it's empty value it's no value if it doesn't build then or, or progress or move forward, and something needs to be adjusted, something needs to be changed. The fourth thing that I found is you should remain still until divinely moved. Sometimes we continue to move, continue to move because of our lack of patience, but the divine is asking us to sit, ground ourselves, and be able to listen to spirit. If you cannot listen to your spirit, you should not be moving on a constant pace. You should sit still and listen and then move. And sometimes we stay too still for too long when the opportunities have presented themselves that we've asked for, but we're scared to take them. So don't allow fear to keep you back, okay? Allow fear to ignite you, to inspire you, to go for what you prayed for. Remember to set aside time for your spiritual well-being, your spirituality, your spiritual practices. Spirituality is a practice. Being spiritual is a practice. So how are you setting aside time every day to build your spiritual well-being? Whether it be writing in your journal, exercising, doing yoga, praying, writing down your prayers, whatever it is, make sure that it is something you are practicing. These things will bring a level of peace to you that allows you to vividly hear God's answers to you. And if you are not vividly hearing God's answers to you, then you are not grounded. You are not being still. And remember that the opportunities that you pray for could be in your face, but if you're not grounded, it's going to be very difficult to see them. And they will be presented in unexpected ways. God is very sporadic sometimes and spontaneous. So just make sure you're looking around and make sure you're being still before because you could think everything is the answer, but it's just there's one answer there and you can't see it because you haven't been capable of listening. You will know when you're being divinely moved because everything will feel aligned and it'll scare you a little bit. If you have troubles recalling your prayers or what you've asked God for, I do highly recommend writing them down. This will help you to figure out if that's even really what you want. Are you really asking God for what you want? And sometimes what we want has nothing to do with God and what God wants for us and what God has put on our path for us. So inspect the opportunity that you desire and see if it fits your goals, your aspirations, and your higher self. And keep in mind that sometimes God will allow us to get what we prayed for just to show us that it's not what we wanted. It's not what resonates with our spirit. Oftentimes we ask God for opportunities that actually feed our egos and you know we do get those opportunities and then we see that it's weighing us down and making us feel heavy and making us feel unaligned with who we are and it starts to make us question who are we what do we want and what does God want for me this is exactly why it's so crucial to be still until you're divinely moved it's so crucial to ground yourself and connect with God before you start praying for these things that may not be feeding you at all. Pay attention to the shifts that are happening in your life, the changes, the frequencies that you're feeling, the energies that you're feeling. Places that make you feel uncomfortable in a negative way, places that make you feel tired, drained, and just empty from good energy. How do these environments influence you? How do these people influence you? And this is just a reminder, the deer is literally reminding you that your life will change tremendously in a good direction when you allow the divine to become your influence, when you allow the divine to push you towards a certain direction. It's more powerful than just getting what you want.
It's getting what you need. It's getting what the world needs from you. It's getting what God expects from you. It's fulfilling your truest, deepest emotions, desires, and needs. The fifth thing that I found is about nurturing your body. It is so important to nurture your body. Deer actually groom each other and themselves, and it is a process that helps to remove parasites. And I think of that very similar to us nurturing our body to exclude these negative thoughts that we have where we think we're unworthy or we think our body isn't worthy or we think these negative things about ourselves because we're not taking care of ourselves. When you take care of yourselves, you implement that worthiness. So implement that worthiness by giving yourself self-care and also spread the influence of self-care by inviting someone out to go get a facial with you or go get a pedicure whatever it is invite those influences of self-care and self-love whether it be with yourself or with others I definitely think that self-care is contagious. So if people see you taking care of yourself, they're going to be inspired by that, especially when you have children. If they see their parent taking care of themselves, they will take care of themselves as well. So it all starts with you. And on days that you love your body the least, give it the most love and care because that's when it needs it the most. Now let's get into the mythology and folklore of the deer. A lot of the folklore and the mythology that I found was very strange because a lot of these cultures believe something specific about the deer, but they have like these weird aggressive stories. So I'm just gonna share two with you guys and make sure you definitely do go check out the article on my website, leanamysticoracle.com to get more of an in-depth reason as to why you see the deer. So in Chinese mythology and folklore, they actually believe that deer are a symbol of prosperity and longevity as they are seen to be a huge herd of them behind Shaolao. And I really hope I'm saying that name right, but uh, that's a god named Shaolao and he has this herd of deer behind him. And they are also believed to symbolize longevity because they're capable of finding the I think it's like a fungus of immortality. So that was very interesting to find. But in their folklore, they have this feng, feng zhu, or oh my god, I don't know how to say it. It's F-U-Z-H-U, where it's a stunning white deer with four antlers. And it's said to be very peaceful and it lives on a mountain that is filled with beautiful jade and gold. And it's just gorgeous. And then it has this very vast pond and it's considered to be a magical pond. And this mystical deer with four antlers appears when there's gonna be a big flood that's gonna happen in the area. And it's kind of gonna just like eat up the whole area, mess up the whole area and create very big damages. So I thought that was interesting to think that the deer is a symbol of prosperity prosperity and longevity but in the folklore I found this mystical deer that only appears when there's gonna be a big flood that's gonna ruin the area now to me maybe that can mean longevity of change longevity of life after that flood you know maybe new growth in a prosperous land afterwards because maybe the land was dry whatever it means it's very curious to find that story but they also believe that the deer represent prosperity and longevity very curious i would love to speak to someone who's very familiar with chinese mythology so that we could figure this out together. Native American mythology was even more curious for me, so let's go ahead and get into this. So deer are often associated with fertility and creation. They're viewed as caretakers of the earth and even protectors of the forest. They're kind of considered king of the forest. They also believed that deer were messengers of intuition and gentleness and even sensitivity. And even though it seems contradictory to what Native Americans believe in when it uh, comes to what they represent, there's actually a story of a woman who will allure men, basically lure men in to her while she's in the forest. And as they approach closer and they notice that she's half deer and half woman, they they may freak out or something and then she'll just like stomp them to death. So I thought that was very weird, very strange. But like I said, they do believe that they are a representation of fertility, creation, and all these things. But I guess it's also a representation of protection 
Maybe that woman feels she needs to protect herself and that's why she stumps him out. But let me know what you guys think. I think that these curious facts were curious and the mythology was very curious as well. So go ahead and comment down below what you think about the deer, how it's been showing up for you, and what you believe it symbolizes for you. And I wish you all of the beautiful luck that the deer spirit animal brings you and all the blessings as well. And I will see you guys in another video. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, and comment down below. See ya!